You're listening to The Craft, a podcast for professional content creators who want to learn more about the people, process, and strategy behind the best content on the web. In each episode, we talk with writers, designers, and editors from the world's leading content teams and learn the secrets to their success. Let's jump in and get you inspired for your next story. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Craft, brought to you by Shorthand. I'm Rachel Westbury, Senior Editor here at Shorthand, and today my very special guest is beaming in all the way from a very hot UK. It's Ryan Law. He's the VP of Content at Animals, which is a content marketing agency for tech businesses. But that's not all Ryan does. He's quite a busy guy, as it so happens. He's also the author of two science fiction novels called The Rainmaker Writings. Look them up. They're excellent. And he's the host of a podcast called The Ash Tales, where he shares apocalyptic short stories with atmospheric music. It's uh, definitely worth a listen. So today I'll be asking Ryan all about his career successes, his failures and rookie moves, and all the learnings that he's had along the way. Welcome, Ryan. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and thank you for shouting out my beloved books as well. It's always a happy day when someone takes the time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, for those who are beaming in and, and watching this in the video format, Ryan, would you like to tell us what is in the two frames on the wall there? I would. So it's slightly narcissistic, I think, but I'm going to have to embrace it. If you take the time to write books, you may as well get the covers printed and framed on your desk next to you so that Whenever you have a Zoom call, everyone is forced to look upon your majestic works. <laughs> and how majestic they are, really. <laughs> I, the covers are pretty good. I paid somebody who's much better at designing than me to make them, and they did a fantastic job. <laughs> oh, look at that. We're on to our first lesson already. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, Ryan. So to kick off today's episode, can you tell me a little bit about your career background and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, of course. So I've basically very easily been doing the same thing for about 12 years now. My career has been very, very straightforward in that sense. Basically, from the time I was at university, I realized that I wanted to write for a living. It was something I enjoyed, something that I was uh, seemed to be fairly good at. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be really, really cool if I could actually make a living and earn a good wage out of doing this thing? So yeah, I started off at university as a freelance writer, actually. Uh, a friend of mine encouraged to go to one of these awful, very underpaying websites where you can earn about two and a half dollars for, you know, a thousand words of writing. And although it wasn't very much pay at the time, that was enough to make me realize, yeah, you can earn money from the written word. Like it was this amazing realization I had. So I've been doing some variation of that ever since. I started off doing that at university and basically like paying my way through university, earning just enough for the occasional beer and tuition fees and that kind of thing. And when I finished university, got my degree in economics and sociology and realized I didn't want to do anything related to economics or sociology. I just kept doing that basically, uh, kept working with companies online, writing blog posts, eventually started working with some marketing agencies, uh, and they were much, much better to work with than lots of like solopreneurs and that kind of thing, because instead of having to juggle 20 customers and loads of fluctuations in work. I could basically work with about three marketing agencies and get a very consistent amount of work, lots less hassle in terms of managing people. And eventually one of those agencies saw it, uh, an advantage to hiring me full time. So I joined them, became their like content manager. And eventually we kind of pivoted the agency to focus just on content marketing because it was just taking off at that time. It was really popular. And I became a co-founder at that point and we changed the whole direction of the company. Did that for a few years, had a wonderful time, uh, and then joined Animals, which is where I've been for four and a half years now. Uh, and yeah, had a pretty wonderful time, had a pretty wild journey all the way from content manager up to part of the leadership team there. That's amazing. Wow. I love that it started out as a university side hustle that you found yourself sort of at first falling into because you liked it and then it turned out you really liked it and now look at where you are that's just awesome yeah the, the impetus was basically i was tending bar from 11 till 5 a.m every night and not doing a very good job at my degree and thought there's got to be a better way to earn a little bit of money than just tending bar overnight it turns out there was actually yeah writing blog posts who'd have thought <laughs> who'd have thought indeed 
So Ryan, as promised, we're going to dive into some of your defining career successes, whether that looks like a standout piece of content, a winning content strategy, or anything else in between. So thinking about the span of your career so far, what successes stand out to you and why? So one of the things I think about the most and actually learned the most from is a, a single blog post that I wrote a very, very long time ago when I was actually this like nascent freelancer trying to make my way in the world, trying to earn some money. I'd basically yeah been self-employed for about a year, fresh out of university and struggling to make ends meet, struggling to find people that wanted to pay for content. And I wrote a, a shame-faced blog post that was the 50 best content marketing agency blogs in the UK. And the reason that was so impactful was because it was uh, yeah, a totally shame-faced marketing effort for myself. I didn't pick these agency blogs because they were actually the best. I picked them because they were the 50 agencies that I thought might want to work with me. So creating that list, putting all those agencies in there, doing loads of outreach to each of them to tell them they'd been featured. I even created a little badge that said top 50 marketing agency blog. You can embed it on your website and emailed everyone. And that actually got me my first few big, long-standing customers as a direct result of that blog post. Didn't do much traffic, didn't you know, raise awareness outside of that group of people, but it was a very focused application of, you know, I want to work with these people. This piece of content will let me do it. So, uh, yeah, I've been very proud of that. A single blog post ever since. Who'd have thought that a single blog post written quite early on in your career, if I'm correct, would lead to so much was that when you were still a student or were you working in content at that time i just graduated from university so i was sitting in my my childhood bedroom at my parents house with my laptop trying to draft you know a dozen terrible articles a day for people that were paying about ten dollars each time and yeah i thought you know i've worked with one agency it'd be really cool if i could work with a few more how do i go about getting myself in front of those people using the toolkit i have accessible to me and that was the kind of application of that that I thought I'd give a go and yeah it turned to work out very very well anytime you tell people they're amazing and you've got an award for them that seems to pique their interest I think <laughs> oh absolutely I'm just loving the image of someone fresh out of uni producing little badges that says you know you're the top 50 for agency blogging <laughs> and, yeah. and these agencies are like what? <laughs> I know I know and I was a terrible designer using a bit of you know free software I found online and I've still got the badge saved somewhere and it's kind of hilarious looking at how amateur it is, but it worked. Yeah. Some people actually embedded it on their agency blogs, which was amazing as though I was some like accredited institution. Yeah. It was a little bit of a wild west back then content marketing, I think maybe 10 years ago, it was a, a very new, very nascent thing. And a lot of the tactics we take for granted today that don't work very well, worked very, very well back then, actually. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask then, would you suggest those earlier on in their content marketing career to try something similar out or would you sort of advise otherwise these days? I think some application of that, yeah, is a wonderful idea because we tend to think about content marketing in the aggregate, you know, like how many people can we bring, how much traffic will turn up at our website, but there's actually, you can have much more focused applications of that skill set to get the precise people you want to notice you to notice you. So a good exercise to ask is just, you know, who are 50 people I want to hear about me that might want to work with me? And what is the most direct way I can use my skills to reach them? Maybe it is a listicle like that. People are a little bit more savvy today, but there's probably some version of that, I think, that you could come up with and get good results from. That's amazing. How brilliant. I'll have to see if, if you've still got the link to that first amazing blog that really started things off. I'd love for you to send it through and I'll pop it in the show notes for our listeners to have a look at because that's just classic. That's got to go in. <laughs> I will. And you can see me with, I had hair back then. I was wearing my university like graduation cap in my author photo. It's uh, yeah, it's quite a blast from the past. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Was there another piece of content or a, or a winning strategy that springs to mind? So one thing not particularly a content or a strategy, but something that I'm very proud of is actually since joining animals, moving from content marketing manager, working directly with customers all the way up to the leadership team and the experience of having done that and the things I've learned along the way, because yeah, I've always been a writer first and foremost, that is a primary skill set I've had. So to be able to help out within the you know structure of a company and 
be given lots of opportunities to try new skills and get better at those skills and eventually work my way up through loads of different roles to yeah, leadership at a very, very big agency like animals. That's something I'm hugely proud of and I've yeah, learned a lot along the way as well. That's amazing. And it's always such a delight seeing the work that animals put down. It's genuinely always refreshing and inspiring in some way, like a really fresh approach to content. Again, I'll pop a, a link in the show notes for anyone who wants to have a peek. But yeah, if, is there like a standout decision in terms of that journey from, you know, sort of mid-career up into leadership that you could talk to? Yeah, maybe the most important thing there was uh, the decision to focus a bit more on content strategy. Because obviously, as a writer, we spend all of our days for the most part writing. We're very immersed in the minutiae of our craft and thinking about an individual article and how to structure it in the best way, how to deliver it in the best possible way. And it can be quite hard to find the headspace and the time to think about the structure that exists above that. What is it that gives that one article power? What makes it effective? And that's normally the content strategy. Who are the people you're writing for? What is the correct distribution channel for content generally? How should we research and source this information? All those kinds of things. So I have the I don't know, I'm very lucky the fact that I get bored very, very easily. So I generally try and do something, get good at it. And I want to move on to something that's a bit harder or a bit different. And animals, that meant strategy. I you know, tried to get as good as I could at writing and I wanted to focus on the thing that I thought was higher leverage and content strategy. So I started helping other people out on the team. Helping out with uh, reporting was one really interesting thing trying to analyze the success of what we're doing and learn from it and build a feedback loop that we could use to make better things afterwards and actually trying to help create strategies as well. So talking to customers, working out what they wanted to do, what resources they had, and then trying to reconcile those with a, something that we could actually deliver with part of our content marketing toolkit and just doing that more and more helping out as kind of almost on the side of what I was doing meant I could build up experience in that area, meant I could talk credibly about it and meant that the rest of the company saw that, yeah, this is a helpful thing for Ryan to do. Maybe this could be a role to the extent that, yeah, we ended up creating a role and Cassie and myself became Animal's first content strategist just as a direct result of helping out with strategy wherever we could. And that unlocked, yeah, a huge number of doors for us in our, in our later careers, I think. How excellent. That's amazing. <laughs> Well, some great advice for anyone listening who's looking to sort of expand on their current skill set beyond, you know, the art and practice of writing and grammar and structure and puns, of course, of course, an essential part of any content marketing and writing, right? <laughs> I still, I mean, I do still have a soft spot for puns and everything I write. Yeah. So. <laughs> so good. The real question here is, does SEO like puns? That's a question for another day, maybe. <laughs> So it's been really valuable to hear about your successes, Ryan. Was there any more you wanted to add before we jump over to our next section or segment, I should say? I probably have much more to say about my failures than my successes, so we can probably uh, dive straight into that if you want. <laughs> All right, failures, let's do it. So I always like to preamble or add a little preamble here about the fact that, you know, that that despite the amount of value we get from talking about our successes, there's a whole lot of value that can come from talking about our failures and our mistakes as well. It's so not easy. It's sometimes cringy, but I just think it's always fascinating to hear how people learn and grow and pivot as a result of, you know, the mistakes they've made along the way. So in the name of courage and growth, let's talk failures. Thinking again, Ryan. Over the span of your career so far, what are a couple of examples of some mistakes you've made and a few things you've learned from those? Yeah, happy to share. I love what you said as well. I think success is actually a pretty bad feedback loop. You don't always learn a lot from the things that go right. And it's uh, yeah, much more fruitful to fail a bunch of times to then get close to something that does work. So in the spirit of that, the one that always comes to mind, so at my last agency, the one that I co-founded, I was in charge of all of our marketing as I am at Animals today. Uh, and I'd very much grown up thinking that content marketing and SEO were the same thing. There was no daylight between those two concepts. So I spent all of my time writing a bunch of articles designed to get as much traffic from search as possible. So I was targeting loads of keywords like uh, SaaS pricing and that kind of thing. 
with the hope that this would bring in SaaS companies to us. They'd want to work with us and give us all their money. And it was a success in the sense that we got lots and lots of visits. We got to like hundreds of thousands of page views to the blog. And it was an absolute failure where it really mattered because we didn't close a single new deal for an entire year off the back of that traffic. And that's a lesson I've carried with me for the rest of my career because we were getting loads of people to the web website and they were just not the right people. And even if they were the right people, the type of content we were writing was not enough to instill trust in us and to demonstrate our beliefs and how we thought about the world. Because, you know, I was like a 20 year old writing about SaaS pricing models when I've never worked at a SaaS company, never priced a SaaS company that's not particularly credible. So yeah, the big lesson I took from that was there are different ways to use content beyond just SEO. And quite often the thing that generates traffic is not the thing that will generate a lot of business for your company as well. Mm, that's a big learning and a tough one to take on at such a young age as well. Well, yeah, it's only with the benefit of hindsight that I realized I did have a big part to play in the fact that the, you know, the agency ultimately failed as a result of this and a few other factors. You need to close business to grow and to hire and to do all the things you wanted to do. And although there were lots of, you know, other things like sales process problems, other stuff like that, if I had done a different job, if I had approached lead generation in a different way, certainly would have helped, you know, having more people coming to the blog and interested in working with us. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you've taken those learnings into your current role? Like, have they informed your current strategy in, in any kind of way? Yeah. So joining animals was a huge eye opener because I'd come from this world of SEO content and keyword research and everything like that. And I joined animals and we basically didn't do SEO. There was no keyword research. There was no structure to that. It was the exact opposite kind of content marketing. It was all storytelling and narrative driven and interesting ideas and personal experience and interview based content. And I realized I just had this huge blind spot about this entire other world of content. And the strategy we use at animals on the blog is something I inherited from a guy called Jimmy Daly, who was my predecessor at animals. And I'm still doing it because it works so well. And it's the exact opposite of what I did at my last agency. I almost never write for keywords. Uh, I never care about traffic. The blog today is getting a fraction of the traffic even my other blog used to do, despite the fact that we're like a 130 person company, work with hundreds of companies, all that kind of thing. Because we basically just, we solve the problems that our target audience cares about. And we write for a very small, very precise audience. And when they find us, they talk about us, they care about us, and they are generally quite interested in working with us as well. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing on that. Do you have any other examples of mistakes or failures you'd be uh, open to sharing on the podcast? Yeah. Um, so one of the roles I've had at Animals was as a content strategist. So my entire job was basically talking to new customers and working out how we would reach their goals using content marketing, being creative, coming up with a framework that we then create articles within. And I remember one particular strategy I pitched to a customer. It was a very famous company, a company that I'd always admired as well. And I really wanted to do a good job for them. And I poured my heart and soul into it. And as I was going through the kind of kickoff call, we're talking through the strategy, their eyes were starting to glaze over. I could tell, you know, they weren't feeling it. This was not the right direction at all. And I couldn't really accept that at the time. My brain was not willing to be pliable enough to say, hey, maybe we should go back and ask some more questions to start again. So I basically took it upon myself to persuade them that I was right, that I knew best, that my strategy was the right thing for them. And, you know, we got off the call and no one was quite happy, but we thought we'd give it a go. And unsurprisingly, it didn't work very well. We wrote loads of articles within it and they were good articles, but it didn't do the thing they hoped it would do. And eventually that customer left because we didn't manage to achieve their goals. And I was very sad about that. And again, only with the benefit of hindsight and a little bit of distance did I realize that my job is not to persuade people that I am right. My job is normally to listen better. If they're not interested in something, if they think it's not going to work, there's probably a good reason for that. And I have to go back to the drawing board many, many times to find something that will work, that they're going to feel good about, that we can execute on. Uh, yeah, it's a very humbling, humbling thing being a strategist and trying to come up with things because you do have to be wrong lots and lots of times and be okay with that. And I wasn't okay with that when I was younger. <laughs>
It's a huge learning. And it's interesting what you said earlier about that feedback loop. I can see that that early learning around making sure you're getting feedback from early on and building that into your strategy. I can really see that at play with how you approach briefing in new clients now. Would you say that's pretty pretty much on par with with how you approach it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anytime you come up with you know a, a pitch for an article or a content strategy or anything like that, it's it's only ever a guess based on the information you have at your disposal. And as soon as you introduce a, a blog post to the real world or you talk to a customer and learn a little bit more, those preconceptions normally get shattered very, very quickly. And you have to be willing to add that new data set back into the mix and try and come up with something better based on that. I guess the benefit of that is, is that, you know, us content marketers, very humble folk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, honestly, I do think that most of the people that I talk to and work with, um, maybe it comes from being slightly like introverted and uh, introspective in a lot of cases, because we're all sitting writing and trying to come up with good ideas and good articulations every day. But there aren't that many egos in the content, I don't think. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for being so candid with these answers around you know, all the mistakes and learnings you've had there and how some of those failures have helped inform the way you do strategy today. Were there any other little oh, learnings, let's say, that you wanted to cover up before we go to the next question? Just a very quick one, maybe, but um, something mm. I'm kind of learning about myself at the moment and trying to get better at dealing with is that a lot of um, like career decisions I've made have been based actually on ego versus you know, the thing that would be better for me or the thing that aligns with where I want to go in the world. Uh, and I think that's been a product of um, working at agencies. I've always had a bit of imposter syndrome because, you know, we work at agencies and we basically serve these amazing, really famous, really well-renowned tech companies. And there was always a little part of my brain that was like, hey, Ryan, maybe you should go and work at those companies and not the agency that's kind of behind the scenes and all that kind of thing. And I've had some... A lot of time wasting and, you know, very painful experiences in terms of actually pursuing jobs at those companies. And in some cases, even joining those companies only to realize that it wasn't the right fit. Uh, because ultimately, yeah, it was just ego that was driving me to do that. Uh, in terms of like the thing I enjoy doing, where I can add the most value to people, uh, working at animals at an agency like this has been an incredible place to be. And I've, um, I think the older I get, the more lucky I realize I've been actually in the past few years and the more grateful I've been to work in this kind of environment. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a great point, Ryan, because I feel like working at an agency, it would be so easy to have that seed planted of like, oh, the grass might be greener, but it's, a, I think, you know, it's a great reminder that sometimes, you know, the grass is greenest where you water it. And when you take stock of all the great variety of work you get to do at an agency like that can be a great motivator for some as well getting yeah. to work across all, all kinds of things yeah exactly and you know we're very privileged that i've we're basically a team of people that focus on one thing and that is the thing i care about and that is writing there's no other like company structure no other environment where everyone cares so much about writing because we're an agency that's what we sell a lot of content marketers they end up you know they're the only writers within a team of hundreds of people that are not writers. And that's a very different dynamic and that can bring a lot of friction with it, I think. Well, thank you again for being so candid and sharing about your, your learnings and all the things that have come from those um, really tricky failures and mistakes, but it's, you've been so like open, which is just amazing. So this next question, it's a little cheeky. It's cheeky, but I think it's always worth asking. We've all been the rookie before. We've all made those really cringeworthy mistakes that we wake up, you know, two o'clock in the morning, years on, and you, and you think to yourself, why did I do that? Why did I do that? But they're always funny. So what's a rookie mistake you've made, Ryan, that's kind of funny in hindsight? Well, one that I think about all the time, this is maybe like uh, eight or nine years ago, and I still wake up thinking about it. So the agency I co-founded, I was our main writer and I did lots of interviewing of our customers because we were writing about things that I knew nothing about. And one of these customers, uh, they created software that did automated real-time intelligence for call center queuing systems. So like whole world I knew nothing about, quite complicated, lots of like specialized language and terminology. 
And I was interviewing one of our customers, the very impassioned, very, very smart founder of this company. And because I was like such a, a noob and I, you know, I always wanted to give a good impression and hear them out. I ended up on this hideous, hideous interview that ran for about four and a half hours continuously. And at no point did I think to say, Hey, maybe we should take a pause. Maybe we should stop. Or, you know, maybe talking for four and a half hours isn't conducive to getting, you know, succinct, useful information for a blog post. I literally sat in that chair for four and a half hours, getting increasingly sad and irate and confused, listening to this topic that I barely knew anything about. Uh, and I was just so disheartened and upset and angry at the end of that call that I just like walked out of the office and went straight home and had a, a beer or two. <laughs> oh my God. Four and a half hours to have to be, you know, have your, your interview brain switched on and sit and take it in. Oh, I'm surprised you, you stuck it, like stuck it out past an hour and a half. That's impressive. Yeah, see, today I wouldn't do that exactly, you know, because um, <laughs> I, I internalized the idea today that people come to us because we are, we're good at the thing we do. And they, well, sh in most cases, are willing to listen to our judgment. And if I were to say, we could probably leave it here, we'll pick this up tomorrow, or I've got everything I need for this article, that's amazing, thank you, that would have been fine. But yeah, I was a complete rookie, so it didn't even uh, occur to me that I could do that when I had that power. <laughs> Wow. Did you walk out of that four and a half hour interview feeling any more knowledgeable about the amazing queuing tech that the company, uh, you know, were handling or, or were you just like, you know, bamboo, bamboozled after that? I think I learned a huge amount in the first 30 minutes and then the <laughs> remaining four hours was probably just serving to like knock useful information out of other parts of my brain as I you know, became more and more disheartened with the whole thing. So. Yeah, definitely not, not the most <laughs> fruitful thing to do. And even what do you do with a four and a half hour recording? How do you, that's like pages of transcript. Oh, I don't know. No, no good came out of that call. I will say. <laughs> oh goodness. I I'm very glad that you no longer sit in on four and a half hour interviews just for the sake of your ears, you know, that's, that's tough. Well, Ryan, this next question ties in pretty nicely to your rookie mistake answer. What advice would you give your younger self? So I've been thinking a lot about things that are going well in my current life and how have they reached this point? And the answer is almost always that I started doing them about 10 years ago. So my biggest bit of advice would be basically pick things you enjoy or you want to get good at, or you would maybe like to have a career in one day and do them and don't get distracted and just doggedly pursue it as hard as you can for a very, very long time. And view the kind of success of those projects in big decades long uh, increments because yeah my experience so far has been that it's taken about 10 years for pretty much everything i'm good at to reach that point and to get some measure of reward from it so yeah i think that's a good thing to do wow what what do you think younger ryan would think hearing that advice like stick it out for the long haul it's going to take a decade how do you think he'd react to hearing that Oh, it's terrible advice, isn't it? From the per perspective of someone that, you know, is very excited and eager and wants to pay off from things in the short term. And, and it's one of those truisms where everyone always tells you that, you know, things, there's no overnight success, et cetera, et cetera. And as, yeah, as I've gotten older, I've realized truisms are truisms because you don't believe them when you're young and then you get a bit older and you realize they are completely true and full of so much profound wisdom. So it might not be particularly I'm not sure I'd like the advice. I'm not sure I'd follow it very well, but that's still worth sharing. I think in terms of like my writing, my career, I play a lot of guitar and record music and things like that. I've been weightlifting for about a decade and yeah, that seems to be the sweet spot. Like 10 concerted years of effort, a thing you care about. That seems to be uh, very fruitful. Mm, that's great advice. And certainly, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> for, for anyone in the sort of early to mid career to hear that, you know, 10 years is the number to strive for. So you pick well and pick your passions. I think that can be really optimistic and hopeful. You know, if you know, you love something, why not? <laughs> well, I guess, so there's a good point you made there actually, in the sense that picking a thing you love is it, it often feels like, how do you align the things you love with the things you want to do for a career? It's quite tempting to think of them as separate things. You have to do your job when your job is your job and you pursue things for fun. Uh, and the thing I've realized that actually is there are normally 
ways to make a living out of the thing you enjoy, as long as you are willing to shed a, a little bit of the kind of assumptions you might have about it. Because I always thought, I want to write, how do I make a living out of that? And the classic answer was you either write a book and you pitch it around to agencies and maybe 40 years later, you'll strike it lucky. Um, or else you become a journalist and you know, famously, you don't earn very much as a journalist. It's a you know, terrible industry to actually make money from. And it turns out, yeah, they had to do neither of those things. There was this amazing nascent industry of content marketing that let me do the thing I loved and get rewarded for it. And yeah, I think you can quite often align passions and work uh, in that way if you take a little bit of time to think about it. Amazing. Well, Ryan, I think that ties in pretty nicely then to my next question for you. What's been the most interesting or fascinating change that you've seen in the industry? I'm currently absolutely obsessed with AI writing tools and the impact that's having on the industry, particularly since GPT-3, this natural language generation model got released by OpenAI. Because there's this very famous quote, which I'll horribly butcher now, so I won't even attempt it, but the idea that any technology is basically like indiscernible from magic at a certain point, you know, that technology is just this crazy, magic, beautiful thing. I never really believed that and never really felt it that much because a lot of these amazing technologies had never touched my life in a particular way until I played with GPT-3. And I had this moment where I put, I actually fed the opening chapter from like the book I was writing into GPT-3 to see what it would do with it. And the paragraph it spat back, it was really, really good. Like it read as though a human had written it. There were interesting ideas in there that I had not thought about that could potentially unlock directions I would like to take the story. And some of the prose was just beautifully written, like really, really good prose. And that was pure magic. The idea that technology could do that, and that uh, wasn't plagiarized, that wasn't ripped from any existing place. That was something brand new created by that language model. So I'm uh, increasingly obsessed with the impact these tools are going to have on all areas of writing, but particularly creative writing and content marketing in particular. Wow. And so this tool that you speak about, can you add certain parameters around like the types of language, the length of the output and things like that? Yeah. So it's very, very clever stuff. It's basically, so it's a pre-trained language model. So basically mm -hmm. the core bit of software has gone out and it has read in inverted commas, I think some trillions of pages of text. It's read all of Wikipedia. It's read all of the works of Shakespeare every website that was published on the internet around 2019. And what it's doing is it's basically using that data set to work out what it views the rules of language to be. So you can ask it, you can say, Hey, finish this opening paragraph from my book. Give me like two paragraphs. And it can look through the data set for instances of books and the words that commonly appear. And it can look at the words you've asked it and think, you know, what, if I were to predict what is likely to come next in this sequence of words based on everything I've read, what would that be? So yeah, you could do all sorts to it. I think we're still kind of, uh, just about scraping the very edge of what these tools can do, but, um, lots of ways to add parameters and bounding to get different outputs out of it, like article outlines or paragraphs or fiction or product descriptions, website copy, all these kinds of things, because it's read all of them. It has a good idea of what they're meant to look like. That's fascinating and exciting. And I wonder whether for some listeners who do work in content marketing and writing and copywriting, whether that is almost threatening, you know, like whether they have some kind of feelings about these amazingly intelligent pieces of software that can spit out copy that is supposed to be on par with you know, the level you would expect to read on any good website or, you know, item description or, or book even, which is wild. What do you think on that? Do you think, you know, we should be worried or should we embrace it? Is there some kind of middle ground? That was uh, very much, that's the reason I've been spending so much time thinking about this, because my first gut instinct was fear. You know, my entire career is predicated on the fact that I can write well and generally write better than other people. So the idea that literally a bit of software in a freemium SaaS product that anyone can click could do a job that was comparable to that, terrifying. What was going to happen to my industry? What happened to my job? So I've been throwing myself into it to try and answer that question a little bit. And I think there will be some disruption because there are 
very utilitarian, very simple parts of our jobs that AI can probably do just as well as we can. So the example I've been thinking a lot about is lots of very utilitarian SEO content. You know, I can write a blog post that is a definition of a very simple concept and lots of SEO content is that. And AI can do that probably just as well as I can for the most part. But I guess two things which are slightly heartening about this, one of which is at the moment, getting a good output out of these tools still requires a skilled human being to interact with it. A lot of the way I'm using these tools is I will create an article outline. So I'm the one in charge of that. I do the keyword research, the ideation, the bigger content structure that this lives within. I then generate the text within my structure and then I, the skilled human, edit it as well. So there's, you know, the possibility that we will use these tools and our jobs will change, but they will change for the better. We will all become strategists that do slightly higher leverage stuff. And this stuff still can't, it can't interview people. It can't have original experiences. It can't write thought leadership. So there's always that part of it, which I think is unchanged. And the other thing is there's lots of parts of content marketing that aren't fun. I think I know from my own experience, I've written many articles over the years that were an absolute slog. I didn't enjoy. Uh, it wasn't a huge amount of skill that went into it. So actually, if I can delegate that to a bit of AI and focus on the stuff that I am going to enjoy, I think I'm not going to feel too bad about that outcome. Yeah, for sure. I think with a, as you say, skilled human being at the helm, helping direct, you know, where the copy is set to go. And I suppose the boundaries of what we want these tools to do, it does open up some pretty great opportunities to, um, I guess, skip out on some of the more hard slog SEO stuff that maybe isn't as fun. So we can feel good about that, right? We can feel good about that. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. So I'd be keen to hear your take on this next question, Ryan, because in knowing that you are so passionate about all forms of content, whether that be podcasts, books, content that you write as part of the work that you do, but also thought leadership and tech. I mean, you're into a lot of stuff and it's amazing and you share a lot of it online, but I'd love to know what's your favorite piece of content on the web? I could probably think too hard about this. So the first thing that comes to mind, actually, it may be, it may feel like a slightly boring answer, but I, I've learned a lot from this one piece of content. It was a blog post on the animals blog before I ever joined the company written by Jimmy Daly, who was my predecessor. It's called, actually, I can't remember what it's called. I know the URL, it's library versus publication. And that's, that's what this article is famous for because wrapped up in this one article was basically everything I needed to learn about content marketing that I didn't know and everything that I've tried to carry into what I do today, because I'd come from this world where writing content was basically about consolidating as many facts as possible onto a big, long piece of paper. And that was my article. So I was writing all these ultimate guides, quite often called like skyscraper articles. And the problem with that is they're just, they're not very fun to write. It's kind of, this is why I was saying this is something that AI could probably do a good job at. Uh, and they're not very good for the reader as well. It's basically like a very non-selective dumping ground of information. And we're kind of hoping that the reader will trawl through it and find something that's vaguely relevant and interesting to them. It's not very persuasive, not very enjoyable. And this blog post that Jimmy had written is just the opposite. It's completely the opposite of that. He would basically, he'd observed something within the industry, like a truism that people generally regarded to be true. And as a result of the things he was doing every single day, the experience he had, he made a very eloquent, articulate argument for why that truism was totally wrong. And we'd got the wrong end of the stick. And actually we would have much better results and we'd be much smarter if we turned the thinking on, on its head. So the actual idea was basically that we always used to think that when you publish a blog as a SaaS company, you should model it on like a media publication. We basically read a blog post in sequential order. We care about like how often they're published and all that kind of thing. And that's just not the reality of it for most companies. We're writing for search. Most people will come from a one keyword to one article. They won't read a bunch of stuff. And they're generally very agnostic about when it's published. They just want access to a library of comprehensive information that they can you know, explore as they see fit. And it's the kind of idea that you go, oh yeah, obviously that's so, so obvious. That's so you know clever, but nobody had really articulated that before Jimmy, because of his experience, he could see 
this problem and he could draw a very concrete line around what was a very abstract thing and make people all the better and all the smarter for it. And yeah, it just blew my mind. That's been an amazing article for animals because people reference it and talk about it. Um, and it's just such a good representation of how good content marketing can be, I think. Mm, it's funny because when you, when you lay out Jimmy's argument, as you just did, it's like, oh, of course that makes sense because that's how I search. That's how everyone I know, you know, if they're looking for something, they don't go to a specific website. They just look, you know, plug in the keywords and jump in. They don't, they're not worried about when an article was put up. It's that's yeah. Why, why wouldn't everyone else search the same way we do? That's exactly. Awesome. And that's basically what I try and do with the animals blog these days. It's we're trying to find what are the truisms, the best practices that people generally regard to be true. But if you interrogate them with a little bit of scrutiny and a bit, little bit of personal experience, where are the opportunities to say, this doesn't actually work as well as you think it will do. Like we have to be a bit smarter about this. Mm, that's awesome. I, I, I love that approach and I'll be sure to pop a link into the show notes for anyone who'd like to jump in and have a read over Jimmy's thoughts there. Cause it sounds like they were, um, pretty mind blowing for you there, Ryan. <laughs> I can't wait to read it myself, to be honest. <laughs> okay, Ryan. Well, look, I think we're coming up on our time now. So I wanted to close by asking you one last question. If you had a captive audience of 100,000 people and a microphone in your hand, what would you want that audience to know about you, your work, or your approach to storytelling? Question. I actually didn't think about this one beforehand. This is the one question I forgot to think about. Yeah, I'd maybe say... I'm a big proponent of, as I mentioned earlier in the court interview, actually, that you can align the things you love with the things that you get paid for. And I think that is basically what I've been trying to do, increasingly do with in my body of work. So in terms of the content marketing I write for animals, that is stuff that I'm proud of and I enjoy, and it models the type of content that I learned so much from. The books I'm writing, that's my attempt to use writing in a really cathartic, fun, personal way. And also to sell it, you know, and actually maybe earn a bit of money and get rewarded for that as well without having to have the binary outcome that comes from working with a publisher. So yeah, I would say don't, if you are assuming you can't make money doing a thing that you love, uh, I'd maybe challenge that assumption a little bit and find some small way to experiment because it's exactly what I'm doing and I'm really enjoying the process so far. Amazing. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It's been just brilliant to hear about some of your successes, the learnings you had from those early failures and how you took them into your career going forward. So I really appreciate how candid and open you've been and for sharing with us all the things that um, get you excited about being a writer in the modern age. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. This has been a, an absolute blast to chat through. I've really enjoyed it. Well, what an incredible episode of The Craft. There were so many insights from Ryan today, and I really hope that you found this episode just as inspiring as I did. Now, before I go, I wanted to set you a challenge. In this episode, Ryan spoke about the success that he found with taking his passion for writing outside of the workplace. So for this episode, the challenge, should you choose to accept, is to have a crack at earning your very first dollar from a creative project that you've always wanted to produce. Ryan's advice, start really small. For example, why not write a short story and then publish it on Kindle? You might get a few family friends or loved ones to buy a few copies and there you go, you've earned your first dollar. Or you could take some of your best LinkedIn posts and share them in an ebook. Or you could go one step further and kick off a newsletter about something that you're really passionate on and publish it to Substack. As Ryan says, all you've got to do is start that feedback loop and do it not only because you love it, but also to earn a dollar or two along the way. And as always, keep me posted on your progress. You can find all of our socials in the show notes. I would love to see how you earn your first dollar from a creative project outside of work. We have a lot of amazing guests lined up for future. But if you'd like to come on and talk about content and storytelling on the web, then please do get in touch. I'd love to have you. I'll drop a link in the show notes with all the details you need. 
should you like to join me on the podcast? Well, thank you again for tuning into this episode of The Craft. Until next time, happy storytelling. Thank you for checking out this episode of The Craft. This show is brought to you by Shorthand, a platform that helps professional content creators produce beautiful stories without writing a single line of code. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow The Craft wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Or visit shorthand.com slash podcast to get immediate access to all the latest episodes.